Well, good evening, Tucson. It's wonderful to see all your smiling. Most of you are smiling and beautiful faces. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be with uh, someone that I have been working closely with for uh, many, many decades and who is actually responsible for my radio program called Alternative Radio because when I first became familiar with his work, I was really surprised that Chomsky was nowhere to be heard on community radio stations, public radio stations across the country, and so I wanted to rectify that, and that was the beginning of um, alternative radio, and we have over 250 recordings of uh, Noam in our vast audio archive, lectures and interviews and debates, and uh, something for you to check out at alternativeradio.org. So Noam, you have a lot to answer for uh, in terms of uh, you know, supporting independent community radio, and thank you for that. Well, there's so much to talk about, obviously, but uh, let's start with uh, The Economist, not necessarily a very radical uh, journal. It says in its uh, current issue, there's something in the air, and that is, why are, we mi why are so many countries witnessing mass protests? And then it goes on to, to write about uh, all of the countries that have been uh, demonstrating in really unparalleled numbers, hundreds of thousands of people uh, turning out from Santiago, Chile, to Beirut, Lebanon, uh, to the Sudan, to Hong Kong, uh, Haiti, uh, country after country, Iraq uh, as well. What is prompting this massive upsurge in citizen activism? Well, of course, uh each country you look at has its own particularities and special reasons. Uh, but there are some common features which were actually captured pretty well by a young demonstrator in uh, Chile uh, whose comment became a slogan for the huge demonstration. He said, it's not about 30 pesos, it's about 30 years. years. Uh, that's roughly the period of uh, the neoliberal uh, programs that took over much of the world, the United States and other countries. Uh, they've had uh, pretty deleterious effects for the general population, uh, different in different countries. Uh, there's other factors in other countries, but uh, this is uh, common. And uh, what it's led to, we can see very well in the United States. Uh, the United States has uh, one of the more vibrant economies in the modern world, but uh, nevertheless, it has, uh, you, some of you may have uh, seen an article in the New York Times a couple of days ago in the business section uh, saying that the figures look good, but the people don't, are unhappy. Uh, people don't have, a majority of the population says they don't have good jobs, uh, they live very precarious lives. If you look at the statistics behind it, about over half the population has a negative net worth, meaning debts exceeding assets, uh, very little to carry them over if any unexpected development happens, accident or anything else. Uh, meanwhile, 0.1% uh, of the population, not 1%, 0.1%, have over 20% of the country's wealth, and that's accelerating. Its tendencies increased since the Great Recession. Uh, benefits have declined. Uh, the United States is uh, pretty extreme in this respect of all the uh, OECD countries that have rich countries, it's, uh, uh, it's the only one that doesn't have some form of uh, national health care. The uh, result is uh, uh, costs about twice as high as the average and uh, uh, outcomes that are relatively poor. Uh, the uh, discontent is so extreme that for the first time in over a century, as you probably know, uh, mortality is increasing, uh, particularly uh, among uh, uh, the uh, basically working age sector of the white population. 
roughly 25 to 50, and mortality is increasing. That hasn't happened uh, anywhere in a developed society since the huge flu epidemic a century ago. Uh, the, uh, all, uh, and similar things are happening. The con uh, concentration of wealth and, sta and the, there's essentially stagnation for the majority of the population. So the purchasing power of real wages today is about what it was in the 1970s before this uh, assault took place. Uh, it's uh, had uh, the, one of the consequences of uh, concentration of wealth is almost automatically uh, increased uh, power of extreme wealth and the corporate sector over the political system. That happens almost automatically. So there's been a decline in functioning democracy. People feel that the government is not responsive to them. They're in fact correct. Uh, they don't have to read uh, political science journals to discover that uh, about 70% of the population is essentially disenfranchised. Uh, that is, if you the lower 70% in the wealth scale, if you compare their opinions and attitudes, which we know a lot about from polls, with the voting records of their own representatives, there's essentially no correlation. Uh, the representatives are listening to other voices. Uh, the other voices are the donor class for the next election. Somebody's uh, elected to Congress, first thing that he or she has to do is start uh, working on getting funding for the next round. Uh, representatives may spend five or six hours a day just talking to donors. Uh, meanwhile, uh, something is happening in their offices. Uh, there's been a huge explosion of lobbyists during this neoliberal period, and they have something to do. They go to the congressional offices, they sit with the staff. The staff are nice people, but they're overwhelmed by the uh, information true or false uh, expertise, uh, uh, legal backgrounds, etc., of this mass of lobbyists who pretty much run the, uh, write the legislation, uh, which the uh, representative then signs. It's naturally going to have little relation to the uh, people who voted the representative into office. And this, this is felt by people. They know that the government doesn't represent them. It's even, in many ways even worse in Europe. In Europe, the, where you have the same uh, economic issues expanded by the austerity programs, even worse than here, uh, the structure of the European Union uh, transfers essential decision-making away from people, national governments, where they have some influence, uh, to uh, unelected bureaucracy in Brussels. Uh, European Commission on elected the International Monetary Fund, uh, the European Central Bank with the uh, German banks looking over their shoulders. And people feel rightly that they just have it, they have no role in the political system. Meanwhile, they're suffering from the economic policies. Meanwhile, great wealth is rapidly accumulating. Well, the one or another variant of this is happening over much of the world. And it has obvious consequences. People get angry, dissatisfied, resentful, uh, uh, begin to despise the more or less centrist institutions that have been running the world during most of their lives. In, uh, in Europe, the centrist parties, the center-left, center-right parties are basically collapsing. Uh, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, which goes back to the mid-19th century has virtually disappeared. Christian Democrats are sharply declining. Uh, you're getting a rise in fringe parties. Pretty much the same is happening here. Uh, but because of our political system, the parties keep their names, but they're changing their character in the same way. In fact, uh, there was there's some studies recently of uh, taking a look at the political parties in the Western world, just looking at their political programs and uh, ranking them on a spectrum from what's called left to right, 
Uh, the Democratic Party here is sort of right in the center. It's with the centrist parties of other countries. The Republican Party is just off the spectrum. Uh, they're ranked alongside uh, fringe parties in Europe, uh, uh, the, the parties that have sort of neo-fascist roots. And, uh, as, but we have the same breakdown in the, uh, the, the most striking feature of the 2016 election was that the center collapsed. Uh, in the re if you look at Republican primaries for the last roughly 15, 20 years, uh, every time a candidate emerged from the base, they were so intolerable to the establishment that they were just crushed by the concentrated power and force of the Republican establishment. Uh, Michelle Bachman, uh, Herman Cain, uh, Rick Santorum, and so on. Uh, the big difference in 2016 was they couldn't do it. They got somebody who did arise from the base and they couldn't destroy him. Uh, in the Democratic Party primaries, there was something similar. Uh, Bernie Sanders uh, broke with uh, over a century of American political history by rising up to the point of nomination, might very well have gotten it if it hadn't been for machinations of party managers, without any support from the standard array of funders, those who buy the elections, corporate sector and extreme wealth, uh, with no media support. Uh, that's unheard of in American political history. But it's essentially the same phenomenon it's coming from the population. Uh, Trump came from another part of the population, uh, but the centrist institutions are gone. Well, you look around the world, as I say, you find one or another variant of this. Uh, there are special issues. So, for example, uh, in Brazil, which is quite a striking phenomenon, uh, the uh, leading uh, political figure, uh, Lula da Silva, was out to win the election last uh, uh, a year ago, September, October uh, 2018. So, and there is a kind of an elite coup that's been going on for several years, a soft coup. And they handled this by uh, simply uh, putting him in jail on very dubious charges. And furthermore, not only putting him in jail, but barring him from making any public statement, unlike mass murderers, for example. So he was silenced, put in jail. Uh, the, uh, a huge social media campaign began. Uh, we're gonna see more of this in the next year. It had Steve Bannon's fingerprints all over it. Uh, most Brazilians uh, get their information, as it's called, from social media. And it was swamped with the most incredible campaign of lies and vilification and defamation and accusations of most incredible sort. And it frightened people about the opposition. And it scared them into electing a real monstrous figure. In fact, what's been happening in Brazil since is pretty interesting. There's now a situation where Lula, the Supreme Court, wants Lula to get to leave jail, and he's refusing. He's insisting on staying in jail. The reasoning behind it is he wants to be exonerated of the charges, not just released. The Supreme Court is concerned that exposures have come out from Glenn Greenwald's intercept, many of you may have seen them, showing how utterly corrupt the prosecution was and in fact, the, uh, the whole background of the prosecution, the Judge Morrow was revered for the prosecution, was, has been exposed and in being involved in all sorts of shady efforts to get rid of the wrong people. And the court doesn't want any more of this to come out, so they'd like it to be ended. So you have this strange standoff going on. Uh, take a look at other countries, you find their own uh, particular uh, issues like, say, Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon, uh, for one thing, the corruption of the elites is you know, indescribable. One of the uh, 
main charges of the pri against the prime minister was that he gave, uh, I think, uh, 16, $16 million, million dollars to some South, South African model he was having an affair with. Uh, but And uh, meanwhile, the trash isn't being picked up. Uh, on top of this, there's a confessional system that was imposed by France when they were the colonial power. When they left in the 1940s, they made a deal among the Christian, uh, Sunni, and Shia population about how they apportion the governance. There haven't been any polls since then. The Shia are very much underrepresented. And uh, this system really prevents, I mean, formally it's democracy, but it prevents a serious democratic functioning from proceeding. So that's a major issue. Take a look at the next country, you'll find something else. But in this atmosphere of uh, anger, resentment, uh, frustration, uh, contempt for institutions, it's very fertile territory for demagogues to come along and to say, your problem is not the corporate sector and the wealthy and the people who are making the policies. It's somebody who's even more vulnerable than you, uh, immigrants, uh, Muslims, uh, African Americans, uh, Ronald Reagan's welfare queens. And just look around and find somebody to blame it on. And uh, it's been this pretty good evidence by now, a lot of studies, that the uh, xenophobia and the fury against immigrants and so on tends to follow the uh, economic, uh, the cutbacks in the economic policies that are cutting back uh, benefits uh, making wages stagnate and so on and so forth. This is true even in countries like Sweden. Uh, it's there you see a rise in xenophobia and anger, uh, uh, pathological symptoms of various kinds. Almost always it follows after the uh, economic policies that are associated with the whole neoliberal system. That's, uh, and I think that's kind of the underlying background for what's happening. When you look at particular countries, you find other things that are building on it. You know. And what's happening in the Amazon in terms of the f fires and the, the destruction of what's called the lungs of the earth? Well, Bolsonaro, who's the president who was just elected, has basically given uh, carte blanche to the uh, logging to the agribusiness, logging uh, uh, mineral industries, his constituency, and telling him just burn it up and use it for uh, grazing, uh, mineral extraction, uh, uh, anything you want. Uh, there is a certain problem about that. Uh, the Amazon is very fragile. Uh, these are short-term gains, and the forest isn't coming back. Uh, meanwhile, it has regional and, in fact, global effects. Uh, you've, I'm sure you've often heard the Amazon described as the lungs of the earth, uh, an enormous amount of uh, carbon removal from the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, provide, it's the basis for the uh, ecology of the South America region. It's the place where water condenses and is, leads to the uh, rain, that, uh, the heavy rains that uh, permit uh, agricultural development. And then, of course, for the whole world, that means uh, uh, a blow against the very perilous e efforts to try to do something with the, about the uh, ecological catastrophe that's looming very near us. Uh, this is another blow against that. The, the fire at my wife, Valeria, that you just saw, is, happens to be Brazilian. We, the two of us were, in, were visiting Brazil uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, in Sao Paulo, the biggest city which, where we were, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a nice sunny day, all of a sudden it became pitch black, literally, kind of like midnight. Uh, nobody knew what was happening. Uh, well, it turned out that the fires in the Amazon uh, far away were creating so much smoke that they darkened the skies and turned 
bright mid-afternoon into midnight. That's uh, a vivid uh, indication of the kinds of things that are happening. But it's happening mostly out of sight. And associated with this is, uh, assassin is essentially extermination of the indigenous populations that populate those areas as the uh, loggers and miners uh, move into the areas. They want to get rid of the people. We're kind of familiar with that in uh, our own history. And uh, that's the indigenous people who have been the kind of caretakers of the forest and are, live in close interaction with them are being decimated and threatened with destruction. Bolsonaro himself, among his outlandish pronouncements, is that they all, that the indigenous population should be eliminated. Uh, he said that what they really want is uh, iPhones and uh, to be begging and be homeless in the cities, not to live in their own uh, uh, areas that are designated for them. So let's just get rid of them and get rid of this. He's a uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, who is very st supportive of the military. In fact, he claims that the military dictatorship didn't even take place. It was just uh, saving the country from a communist uh, takeover, totally fanciful. Uh, the dictatorship was very harsh and brutal. Uh, but he has criticized the military. He's criticized them on two grounds. Uh, one, he said they're too soft. Uh, they should have done what the Argentine military did at roughly the same time, uh, kill 30,000 people. Uh, but the Brazilian military didn't do that. Now we have this problem of these people around who should have been murdered. He also criticized the 19th century Brazilian military because they didn't behave like the uh, cavalry in the United States and exterminate the native population. If they'd done that, Brazil wouldn't have this problem of indigenous people. That's uh, one of the nice guys who's uh, taking over major countries. Uh, and uh, the Amazon is under very severe threat. Actually, my wife uh, is trying to compensate for it by recreating a small model of the Amazon in our home in Tucson by planting Brazilian trees. So it's taking off a little bit. And that military dictatorship um, lasted from 1964 to 1985. Yeah. Now, that my dictatorship parents, is sorry? worth knowing about. Uh, there was a kind of plague of repression that spread over the whole continent beginning in the early 60s. Uh, the Brazilian dictatorship was the first. It was lauded by the United States, lauded. Uh, the ambassador, U.S. ambassador, uh, jo uh, Kennedy Johnson ambassador, L L Lincoln Gordon was his name, uh, hailed the, uh, take the overthrow of the government and the establishment of the dictatorship as uh, the, one of the greatest moments of uh, freedom in mid-20th century America. Uh, investors poured in, uh, capital poured in, and it was uh, considered a wonderful event, a brutal, vicious, uh, neo-Nazi-style dictatorship. Then others spread around the continent. And our own role in that is not very pretty. If you look at it, it's worth looking at carefully. Now, my parents uh, were immigrants. Your father was an immigrant. Your mother also. came here at a very young age. Was she, was she born in the US? One year old she came. She was one year old when she came. Um, we're sitting here in Tucson, 60 miles from the Mexican border, and things are going on there that can scarcely be believed, not just there, but all across uh, the country with the setting up of detention camps and the separation of uh, children from their parents. How are they getting away with this? How? How are they getting, how is the administration in Washington getting aw away with this? I mean, where is the outcry? Where is the indignation and anger? Well, actually here in Tucson, as you all know, uh, there is a, a reaction, a, a courageous reaction. P people like the uh, No More Deaths group, for example, and others are uh, 
reacting properly. And they do have, I'm sure you're aware, a fair amount of uh, popular support here. But you're true, around the country it's not happening. And we can find out why easily, right nearby. Uh, I don't know how many of you read the uh, online uh, Tucson Sent Sentinel. It's a pretty good newspaper, actually. Uh, they had a report a couple of, probably one or two months ago, I guess, very interesting report. Uh, Steve Bannon was visiting uh, the area. He was going to a gated community, luxurious gated community, south of Tucson. Uh, and the goal was to raise money to privately build a wall. Uh, of course, the government wasn't doing it. And uh, the uh, reporter got into the meeting somehow and gave a careful description of people's reactions, which were pretty interesting. People in this rich, gated community, which is probably the most secure place in the, in the entire world, are terrified. They're afraid that uh, an invasion is coming of uh, rapists, uh, murderers, Islamic terrorists, uh, who are gonna carry out uh, genocide against the white race. And they gotta do something about it. Uh, one of the people there who's actually a state legislator from, not from here, I think from Colorado or somewhere, suggested that we not only, that Arizona not only build a wall uh, at the border, but also at the California border, because we don't want those people coming here. You know, you know, we can laugh at this, but this is real. People are really frightened and terrified. This is an old story in the United States. It's, it's been the most secure country in the world as far back as you can go until since the War of 1812 but it's probably one of the most frightened countries in the world. It's very easy to arouse the population to fear, extreme fear. That's happened over and over. Uh, in recent years, you'll recall when the propaganda began to try to build up support for the invasion of Iraq, it was effective. You know, people were afraid we gotta stop Saddam before he kills us, you know. Uh, you take a look at international polls there was almost no support for the invasion. Practically nothing, barely reached 10% anywhere. The United States, it was real. Uh, when Condoleezza Rice uh, gave that speech about uh, the next thing we'll hear from Saddam is a mushroom cloud over New York, people didn't laugh. Uh, when uh, the propaganda every day, you see it every day about how Iran is the greatest threat to world peace, uh, uh, they're going to attack us. We've got to prevent them from doing this. Uh, and people don't collapse in laughter. They take it seriously. And you take a look at the facts, it's beyond ridicule. You know. uh, but it goes on because people are afraid. Uh, well, the so techniques of propaganda, simple messages repeated over and over again, lock her up, drain, drain the swamp, build the wall, um, etc. Well... Unfortunately, it's true. It goes way back in history. Uh, you can even see the reasons for it. I mean, just take a look at American history. Uh, it, it, the United States is maybe the only country in the world that's been at war almost every year since its founding. People talk these days about endless wars, meaning Afghanistan, but that's kind of misleading. Uh, try to find a year when the United States was not at war starting in uh, 1783, you know, right away, immediate. Remember, one of the main reasons for the American Revolution, they don't teach this in the schools, but it's clear, is a declaration that was made by King George III, Royal Proclamation in 1763, which uh, banned settlement beyond the Allegheny Mountains, okay, in what was called Indian country. So the Indian nations were to be protected by the British from uh, expansion by the settlers. They weren't having any of that. Uh, the 
colonists wanted to move west, as that included huge land speculators like George Washington, one of the biggest speculators, wanted to pick up land in the west uh, in, in, in what, the, what was called in the Constitutional Convention, vacant country, meaning the country of the Indian nations. Uh, Washington launched a war against the uh, Iroquois uh, right during the uh, uh, war with the British. Uh, it went on. As soon as the as independence was declared, immediately the barrier was gone. The war started against the Indian nations. I don't have to recount the history. I'm sure you know it. But right to the end of the 19th century, there was constant aggression, uh, extermination. It's the word that the founders used, uh, virtual genocide. Finally, the Indian nations were, what remained of them were uh, confined to small areas, uh, treaties broken and so on. Uh, I don't have to tell you that we're living in what was Mexico, uh, conquered in a war of aggression. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, well, general president, uh, fought in the war as a junior officer, described it as one of the most wicked wars in history, uh, conquering the Southwest and the West. Uh, by the 20th, the US was in the late 19th century, the US was already intervening uh, substantially in, uh, in the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, by the 20th century, it's just one war after another, almost without a stop. Well, if you're constantly at war with somebody, you tend to be afraid. Maybe they'll come back and do something to us. In addition to that, the United States was, of course, a slave state. Uh, all of the founders, with one exception, John Adams, were slave owners. Uh, the Virginia was the center of power in the early years of the country. Virginia was not only a slave state, it was the producer of slaves. The leaders in Virginia were in favor of the uh, uh, law banning, uh, slave, banning the slave trade. It was 1808, roughly. They were in favor of that because Virginia was producing a surplus of staves, slaves, more than it could use. And it didn't want it wanted them to be sent out to uh, Georgia and Mississippi and to the West so they could sell them. So they didn't want the competition from Africa. So they were opposed to the uh, uh, banning of the slaves, uh, favored the banning of the slave trade. Well, when you're running a, if you take a look at the demography, there were states like South Carolina uh, where the slaves actually outnumbered the, uh, the white population. There were slave rebellions right through the 18th century. Uh, Haiti was, Ter Haiti terrified the United States. This was the first free country of free men, of course, in the Western Hemisphere. And it was slaves who overthrew the, uh, the uh, uh, in that case, French uh, uh, colonial masters. This, the idea that this would have a demonstration effect, what's in recent years called a domino effect, uh, and inflame slave rebellions here was very serious. Uh, that's, uh, so yes, you had to be afraid of them. Uh, that went on. Actually, it never really ended because after the Civil War, there was a brief period of reconstruction, but then something like slavery was reintroduced in other forms and you still needed force to control the subject population. And there was always concern that they might react. So I think if you look deep into American history, there are pretty good reasons for the fear. Uh, by the 20th century, it had no basis in fact, but uh, it's pretty easy for demagogues to conjure it up to try to divert attention away from the real issues. We're seeing that dramatically as with our current leader. Uh, it's happening in Europe, uh, uh, Orban, uh, Salvini, uh, the rest of this collection of gangsters uh, constantly stirring up uh, hatred and fear of uh, alleged uh, dangers to try to divert attention from what they're actually doing to their countries. What? They're not the first in history to invent that, incidentally. <laughs>
When we last uh, talked in late May, you said that if the Democrats move to impeachment, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot. You called impeachment a trap. Well, the Democrats have formally moved on impeachment. Have your views changed in light of recent developments? Well, we don't know for certain. Your guess is as good as mine, but my expectation is uh, uh, that the House will impeach. Uh, the Senate will uh, reject it. I doubt very much that you can find enough Republican senators with a bit of principle. They all know that he's, Trump is impeachable a hundred times over. But uh, do they want to face Trump's uh, adoring uh, militant base? Not many will. So I suspect they'll go along. He'll be freed. He can then make you know, a triumphant speech about how the tribune of the people, the man who's standing up for the common guy, uh, once again overthrew the deep state and the treacherous Democrats and must march on to victory. I suspect that's what will happen. I hope but, I'm wrong. Yeah, there's some similarity with Watergate that you've pointed out. Yeah. Talk about that. That's exactly what I expected from the Miller inquiry. It seemed to me the Democrats were on a suicide mission. Um, it was pretty clear in advance that nothing of any great significance was going to come out of the Miller inquiry. But the uh, liberal Democrats invested so much in hoping that somehow this would save them you know, uh, from the disaster that they had created for themselves, that when it turned out that there was not all that much there, uh, they, were, uh, they provided a huge victory to Trump. I mean, if you think about interference, uh, the whole matter is a, it's pretty hard to take seriously. I mean, suppose there was some Russian interference. I mean, it would be almost invisible in comparison to the huge interference of uh, simply buying elections. Uh, there's very extensive and very convincing work showing that electability to the presidency or Congress is very highly predictable from the single variable of campaign spending. Uh, the Thomas Ferguson, a friend of ours, a great political scientist, uh, has been publishing on this for years. He just came out a couple of days ago with a new paper, which is the most uh, very careful analysis of congressional elections over about, I think, 40 years. And the predictability is just incredible. That's massive interference with elections. It's gotten much worse in recent years because of the decisions of the reactionary Supreme Court, but it goes way back. That's why the Sanders achievement was so spectacular. It broke with this. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the face of that kind of interference with elections, which is just the beginning, I should say, because, as I mentioned, uh, during the neoliberal period since the 70s, there's been an enormous expansion of lobbyists uh, who have an, a tremendous impact on, uh, on uh, the, the form and the nature of legislation. Uh, this is both at the national level and at the state level. There's a insidious uh, uh, aid, uh, uh, organization, ALEC, uh, American Legislative Exchange Council, which kind of operates quietly, but it has the support of a wide range of the corporate system, really across the board. And what they're doing is quite clever. Uh, they're uh, in trying to, and succeeding in imposing legislation at the state level. What happens at the state level is very important for people's lives, but people don't know much about it. Uh, most people can't name their state representative in the state legislature. They don't, it's not reported, you don't pay any attention to it, just something that happens out there. And state legislators are much easier to buy than 
uh, congressional representatives. It doesn't take much money to win a, a, a state election. So what they're doing is uh, imposing identical legislative programs in states throughout the country to try to turn the country into an ultra-reactionary uh, society at the state level. And that includes, uh, incidentally, Arizona was singled out in one of their campaigns uh, to try to destroy the public education system. They want to do that everywhere. Public education system's just too democratic. Uh, there are many ways to undermine it, like defunding and so on. But they're trying to literally privatize it. And they thought that Arizona would be a kind of a soft spot. Maybe they could ram it through here. Uh, uh, other things they're doing are almost unimaginable. Uh, for example, there's, there's a billions of dollars every year of stolen wages, wage theft it's called. Employers simply don't pay their workers. Or uh, if they work overtime, they don't give them what it's due. Uh, one of Alec's main programs is to try to prevent even investigation of this, let alone punishment for it. And they do it at the state level, one after another. Uh, one of their most insidious programs is to try to get states to pass, uh, to agree to uh, vote for a constitutional amendment for a balanced budget. You know what that means. A balanced budget at the federal level means you pour money into the Pentagon you pour money into subsidies for the energy corporations. You cut everything else, okay? That's what's called a balanced budget. If that becomes a constitutional amendment, the effects are horrifying. And they're getting pretty close to the number of states who can do it, all under the radar. Not many people know about it. So all of this is going on at the federal level, at the state level, and we talk about uh, Russians, uh, uh, tiny uh, possible Russian influence somewhere. Um, it's a joke, uh, quite apart from the fact that the US intervenes massively in elections all over the world, uh, perfectly openly, uh, even overthrowing governments. Uh, also in Russia, 1996, uh, the Clinton administration very much wanted uh, Boris Yeltsin, their man, uh, to be elected uh, 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 president in Russia. And he was running badly in the polls, but they poured uh, expertise and money into it and managed to win the election for him. It wasn't secret. They were proud of it. I mean, uh, in the face of all of this, for us to be talking about the Russian or Chinese or Cuban or whatever, influence in U.S. elections is another sign of this same kind of paranoia that shows up in the gated community when they think they have to be protected from an invasion from across the border. It's, uh, it's, we're not the only country in history where the population has been deluded by massive propaganda. Uh, take, say, Germany. Just think about Germany. It's very striking. In the 1920s, Germany was the absolute peak of Western civilization. In the sciences, in the arts, it was considered the leading political democracy in the world, had a very rich tradition. What was it 10 years later? It was the absolute depths of human history. 10 years after that, it's uh, becoming a significant uh, civilized cultural center again. Uh, strange things happen. Uh, we're not immune to them. We have to be frightened about them. Goebbels, who was uh, Hitler's propaganda minister and regarded as a kind of a, you know, brilliant strategist, he said, even though negative things were being said about Hitler and the Nazis, he said, the main thing is they're talking about us. Now, you've described the present occupant of the Oval Office as a narcissistic narcissistic megalomaniac, which is rather unusual for you. You usually don't uh, label uh, politicians so baldly as that. But all the attention that's being focused on him 
seems to just energize him even more. Well, it's been, I mean, it's by now pretty well recognized that uh, the major television networks it gave him a tremendous gift in the uh, uh, 16, the last election campaign. And they, as you recall, they bragged about it. I think it was the head of Leslie CBS. Leslie Monvies, the head of CBS, yeah. He's the greatest thing that ever happened to our ratings, you know. But it might and, be uh, bad for the country, he said. <laughs> he said, as far as the country goes, Trump may be bad, but as far as CBS goes, it's, it's great terrific, for yeah. profits. So they were giving him huge propaganda, and of course he, uh, he relishes that. Uh, he, the Trump administration's doing, you know, the, the, it's, kind of, it's often described as, you know, a kind of fascism, which is a little bit glib. It doesn't rise to the level of fascism. Fascism, remember, had an ideology. The ideology is a state, a powerful state under the control of a, a single party which controls the whole society. It, sets, uh, it controls not only labor, uh, but business and everything else. Uh, we, we're very far from that. We don't have that ideology. Also, it uses force and violence to impose it. But some of the kind of appurtenances of fascism do appear here. Uh, one of them is the destruction of the information system. And this is not done just by propaganda. It's, it's done in a, whether consciously or not, in a very effective way, by just eliminating the notion of truth just flood the information system with massive lies and deceit. Uh, anything that comes to mind when you're, in Trump's case, when he's watching Fox News in the morning and tweets it out, doesn't matter what it is, say anything. And then the fact checkers in the Washington Post uh, will write an article saying you had uh, 83 lies this morning. But it doesn't make any difference because it's, it's cheapening the concept of truth and fact so that people just have no idea what to believe. The fact and truth doesn't exist. It's just uh, it's a, it's a technique of propaganda that's extremely effective and it's working. Uh, there, you know, and, uh, and the effects are lethal. I mean, we, I don't have to tell you that we're facing a major a crisis of uh, an environmental catastrophe, and a large part of the population here simply refuses to believe it. After all, their leader tells them every day it's not happening, and they adore their leader, uh, the man who stands up for them, so he claims, well, shafting most of them at every turn. But he's the leader. We have to follow him. He says it's not happening, it's not happening. About... Uh, the last figures I saw, I um, think about uh, a quarter of Republicans regarded uh, global warming as a serious issue. Uh, many don't even believe it's happening. Uh, the, if the consequences of that are beyond words. Uh, unless this changes, and changes very soon, uh, we don't have to bother talking about anything else because uh, organized human society will disappear uh, within a short period of time. Uh, that's what we're facing. And uh, uh, I should say that we're f there's another existential threat which we all know about in the back of our minds, but again, no, almost no attention is being paid to it. We now have uh, 75 years of living under the threat of nuclear catastrophe. Right now, it's getting very serious, much worse than it's been bad enough in the past. Uh, it's almost a miracle that we've survived, just looking at the record. Now it's escalating. The US is dismantling all of the arms control treaties. Uh, the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, got rid of one of them, uh, the ABM Treaty, which is quite important because uh, anti-ballistic missile sounds defensive, but it's well understood that it's basically a first-strike weapon. 
It's not going to deter a first strike attack. It could conceivably deter a, a, a limit a retaliatory strike. So that's gone. Uh, Trump just pulled out of the INF Treaty, the Reagan-Gorbachev Treaty, that, that uh, greatly improved the security situation in Europe and the world by banning short-term missiles. And the Trump administration was planning for this immediately after pulling out of the treaty in early August. Uh, they carried out a test of a missile which violates the treaty meaning it was already in development and being planned, uh, happens to apparently use pretty much the same technology that the Russians have been complaining about in the IBM installations and on their borders. This just was a saying to Putin, please develop weapons that can destroy us. Uh, and the uh, military industry is just celebrating. They're euphoric, getting all kinds of fat contracts to develop uh, uh, hypersonic missiles, all sorts of uh, uh, you know, uh, unimaginable lethal weapons against which there's no defense. And they're also planning, if you read their, uh, their you know, uh, propaganda handouts, that they're planning to, looking forward to the chance to get contracts down the road to try to develop a defense against the weapons they're uh, creating today, which of course others will uh, carry out as other developments too. Uh, right now the Trump administration has indicated that it doesn't plan to sign the New START treaty if it's re-elected. That comes up in shortly after the election. Uh, the New START's the last major treaty. That puts a limit, and it's been very effective. It's sharply reduced the number of uh, missiles and warheads that the United States and Russia have it doesn't end the problem, but it reduces it. So they want to get rid of that and uh, open the door to just a massive uh, overproduction of uh, missiles and warheads, which threatens survival, of course. Uh, right now, it looks as if they're the John Bolton's last shot before he was kicked out of the administration was to uh, initiate of breaking of the Open Skies Treaty. Uh, that was initiated by Eisenhower, who recognized that if Russia and the United States have ways of uh, carrying out surveillance over the other's territory with joint participation, uh, they will be uh, much more safe. Each will be more safe because they'll know if the other is planning some aggressive act. That's been extremely effective. Looks like the Trump administration is going to throw it out, which again raises the threat enormously. Uh, a little while ago, uh, William Perry, former defense secretary, has spent his whole life on nuclear issues, very serious, uh, sober guy, not given to exaggeration, uh, said that he was terrified at the rising threat of nuclear war and he was doubly terrified because nobody was paying attention to it, aside from the arms control community. Actually, we can add something to that. We should be triply terrified by the rising threat, by the lack of attention, it's barely a word anywhere, and by the fact that it's being conducted by people who know exactly what they are doing. They understand perfectly well that they're sharply increasing the risk of destruction. That's an amazing phenomenon. It's also true of the environmental catastrophe. The people who are exacerbating it uh, understand perfectly well what they're doing. Uh, ExxonMobil is the most famous case that's been investigated. Uh, the ExxonMobil scientists in the 60s and the 70s were in the lead in uh, determining the nature of the threat and its seriousness and you know, informing management of this terrible crisis that's coming from the use of oil. In 1988, James Hansen, who you all know, prominent geophysicist, uh, gave a famous speech in which he kind of warned the public about this danger. 
uh, ExxonMobil management reacted to that by starting to fund uh, denialism. Not outright denialism, because they don't want to be just refuted, but sowing doubt, uh, just saying, well, we don't really know. That we shouldn't uh, act too precipitously. Uh, maybe there's something about clouds that we haven't understood. Uh, that's pretty effective, because that's pretty hard to counter. They knew exactly what they were doing. Rex Tillerson, for example, who was CEO at the time, uh, the head of the, the big banks, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Jamie Dimon, he knows as much as any of us do about the extremely grave threat of global warming. How are they reacting? Pouring funds into fossil fuel extraction. Uh, Take a look at uh, this morning's newspaper, New York Times, business pages. Uh, there's a discussion of uh, how uh, more oil is coming on the market, which may lead to an oil glut, which could be a problem because oil prices might go down and there won't be enough profits. You know? uh, not a word about the fact that this is going to destroy the world. Okay, maybe a phrase here and there. You know? That goes on case after case. Uh, the people, our leaders in the economic, political domain, understand exactly what they're doing and race forward to do it even in a more extreme way. Uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, what's in people's minds? You know, how, how do you deal with this? You understand exactly what you're doing. It's not a minor thing. It's going to destroy organized human society uh, within a couple of decades. But let's race ahead. Uh, we've talked about the Trump administration before. I don't know if we should. No, I think we have, hmm? yeah. Let, let me move on, because you mentioned, you mentioned Gorbachev. What? And Gorbachev, uh, who signed that uh, treaty with the INF treaty with Reagan in 1987, he just told the BBC, actually, uh, in answer to the question, uh, how dangerous is the situation, he used the word colossal, colossal danger, and then he added, all nations should declare that nuclear weapons must be destroyed. This is to save ourselves and our planet. Actually, he has uh, interesting counterparts in the United States. Now, there was a couple of years ago a call for elimination of nuclear weapons by such noted doves as Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, George Shultz, uh, Defense Secretary, Secretary of State under uh, Reagan, uh, uh, Sam Nunn, the congressional, uh, leading congressional uh, 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 expert on nuclear weapons. It kind of didn't register. But people who have any familiarity with the record have to be really appalled. I mean, it's really worth taking some time off and looking at the record of the uh, nuclear age. There's been time after time where we came literally within minutes of nuclear war, which would be terminal war, uh, when human intervention uh, stopped an automated response. Uh, some of these are astonishing, uh, like, uh, I don't know. The Russian submarine commander. Yeah, there was one of the main ones was in, at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962, when you recall it was a very tense moment. Maybe historian Arthur Schlesinger called it the most dangerous moment in history, probably correctly. Now, right at the peak of the crisis, uh, Kennedy had declared a quarantine around Cuba, preventing uh, Russian ships from approaching Cuba. Uh, there were the Russian submarines in the neighborhood. The U.S. didn't know it at the time, but they had uh, uh, their torpedoes were nuclear-tipped. They had nuclear weapons at the, uh, on the torpedoes. The submarines were uh, not designed for warm water. They were designed for the North Sea. Uh, the temperatures in, inside the submarine were getting to the point where it was barely livable. The seamen were passing out. Uh, they had lost any contact with uh, 
the central authorities. There were depth charges from American destroyers falling around them. Uh, they assumed there's probably a war going on. Uh, one of the commanders, some of them thought, okay, maybe we should just, instead of just being dying down here, we should at least die with dignity and send off our torpedoes. If they had done so, the react uh, torp nuclear weapons hitting American, uh, American, uh, the United States uh, would have led to retaliation. Uh, further retaliation, it'll all be over. Uh, the in one of the submarines, the commander was ready to fire the missiles. Uh, the protocol required that he get support from two junior officers. One agreed. The third, Vasily Arkhipov, didn't agree. Um, that's why we're alive. Things like that have happened repeatedly. Uh, and the idea that this can continue is just madness. Uh, you know, some people, uh, there's been debate among scientists uh, who explore, who are searching for uh, intelligent life in the universe and can't seem to find it. And uh, <laughs> one of the theories, not in, in jest, but it's not a joke, is that, yeah, there's intelligent life out there, but when they get anywhere near Earth and see the lunatics who are inhabiting it, <laughs> they don't want to come anywhere near us. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me ask you about uh, tactics, okay? Let's say I totally agree with you on the impending environmental catastrophe and how that is being generated by predatory corporate capitalism, etc. But then you find out that uh, I'm against gay marriage. Uh, I'm against reproductive rights. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a misogynist. I'm a, a racist. Are you going to work with me toward a goal, or are we? Or how do you negotiate that? There's just no choice. I mean, we this this matter is so urgent, uh, as is nuclear war, that you have to make whatever alliances you can. Okay. Actually, there was an interesting. Op -ed article in the New York Times a couple of days ago by a, uh, an uh, evangelical Christian uh, professor somewhere who was uh, uh, d describing the kinds of tactics that she uses and she thinks ought to be used to try to bring the evangelical community to recognizing the importance of uh, doing something urgent about global warming. As you may know, about 80% of them support Trump. Uh, and her proposal was perfectly reasonable. She said, OK, we believe, we all believe, that uh, the second coming is not very far off, maybe in our lifetimes. Uh, when Jesus returns to Earth, we want to demonstrate to him that we have taken care of God's creation. We haven't destroyed it. We've cared for it. It's in good shape. Uh, let's approach evangelical Christians that way. Is that wrong? I think that's quite right. Uh, whatever you can do has to be done. I mean, it's perfectly true, and many of our friends say, that uh, environmental destruction is simply inherent in the capitalist system of maximizing growth and profit and ignoring externalities. And there's a lot of truth to that, but it doesn't help. You take a look at the, maybe we should work to eliminate this system, but you look at the time scale of making radical social changes in institutions and doing something about the urgent environmental crisis, and the time scales just don't match. Uh, the latter has to dominate. Uh, overcoming the environmental crisis is going to be, have to be done within some form of existing institutions. It doesn't mean that on the side you shouldn't be trying to change them, uh, just as you should be dealing with misogyny. But this overwhelms everything. Uh, it just has to, uh, along with nuclear war, there are plenty of other problems, I should say. Uh, the problem of uh, resistance to uh, the microbes it could be a lethal 
problem in the not too distant future. And, uh, because of global warming. Just partly that, but just because of, of their mutations. Uh, say meat production, uh, industrial meat production, it uses, uh, I don't know, maybe half the antibiotics in the country. Uh, that leads to a very rapid uh, evolution of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, microbes that are resistant uh, to any form of uh, microbial control that we have uh, that's happening in hospitals, as you know. Uh, this is uh, uh, leading to development of possible plagues that we'll have no way of dealing with. I mean, there may be things coming from global warming, too. So one of the things that nobody knows anything about, but there's fears, is that uh, as the permafrost melts in the Arctic, vast northern regions, uh, first of all, it releases a huge amount of carbon, um, far beyond what's been released so far. Methane. Hmm? Methane. Methane, but also yeah. other just plain carbon. And uh, it, uh, uh, it, uh, the amount of carbon stored there is fantastic. Uh, but also, nobody knows what's down there. Um, there may be a, a fossilized, there may be bacteria that have been preserved for you know, eons. Uh, for which there's no resistance, could happen. Some were uh, startled by your position in terms of advocating for a small U.S. troop presence in northern Syria along the uh, Turkish border in the uh, so-called Rajaba area, that is to say the autonomous Kurdish state that had been established in that area. What was your thinking behind that? Because you're, you're the... Uh, sine qua non anti-imperialist, anti-interventionist. Well, what was the, uh, I mean, you have to understand that life, human life isn't an axiom system. Uh, we don't have absolute principles that apply in every situation. Human life is much more complicated than that. There are conflicting values, and you have to ask in particular situations what are the human consequences of the choices you're making? So let's take this one. Uh, there was a small U.S. contingent, actually a couple hundred soldiers, in the Kurdish areas, uh, which was a deterrent against a Turkish invasion. Uh, Turkey, you look at the background. Uh, inside Turkey, the Turkish government is carrying out extremely harsh repression and massacres of its Kurdish population. This goes way back, incidentally. Uh, Turkey invaded Syria already, took over part of Syria, extended the repression there, ethnic cleansing, massacres, and so on. Turkey wants to move on to other areas of Kurdish-dominated areas. What's going to happen if they do? Well, we could speculate before. Now we can see it exactly what was predicted. Further ethnic cleansing, further massacres. That was being deterred by a small U.S. contingent which had basically no other function except uh, backing up the uh, Kurdish war against ISIS. Uh, Trump likes to say that he defeated ISIS. Actually, it's the Kurds who defeated ISIS with some American support. In the back, there were 11,000 uh, Kurds men and women killed in the fight, uh, six Americans. Uh, the US, was, uh, spe U.S. Special Forces were backing up the fight, and U.S. air power was, of course, used. But the fighting on the ground was the Kurds. Uh, uh, they're the ones who were, uh, who, uh, with a tweet in the morning, uh, uh, Trump decided to just hand over to their bitter enemies, uh, Turkey and uh, the Assad government. Uh, fortunately for them, uh, Russia moved in. Uh, you're not supposed to say anything nice about Russia here, but in that region, uh, they happen to be the moderate moderating force that's leading to some kind of diplomatic settlement. Maybe we don't like it, but uh, but it's a lot better than continuing this horrendous war which is destroying Syria. And the Russians apparently have moved into 
restrict the Turkish invasion. Uh, so maybe it won't be to as bad as could have been forecast, but it's already pretty bad. Uh, I don't see any problem with uh, having a deterrent U.S. force there at the time. I think uh, we should be careful not to turn our principles into uh, kind of like a catechism that applies no matter what the circumstances. Uh, human life just doesn't allow that. And this isn't the first time the U.S. has betrayed the Kurds. Oh, God, no. It's practically a qualification for a president, <laughs> literally. Uh, it's hard to find. Back to Ford, in fact. It's 1975, Kissinger. every single one. Uh, and often in awful ways. Uh, like Reagan, for example, when the uh, Saddam Hussein, who the U.S. was supporting at the time, uh, carried out a major massacres of Kurds in, uh, uh, in uh, northern Iraq, uh, chemical warfare attacks, uh, killing hundreds of thousands of people and so on. Uh, Reagan tried to deflect the blame to Iran. Uh, when Congress was trying to react in some way, uh, Reagan actually vetoed their effort to react. This is then later when the U.S. decided to invade Iraq, uh, they used this massacre of the Kurds as a part of the basis for the invasion. Uh, how, can we let a, how can we let somebody like that survive who has carried out the Halabja massacre with chemical weapons? Uh, the cynicism is unbelievable. Uh, take Clinton. In the, the 1990s, was the, uh, the Turkish repression of the Kurds inside Turkey has a very ugly history. Uh, the peak of the repression was in the 1990s. Uh, how did the U.S. react, the Clinton administration, by sharply increasing military, uh, the flow of military aid to the Turkish government that was carrying out the atrocities? As the atrocities rose, military aid rose. Uh, 1997, the peak of the atrocities, uh, Clinton sent more aid in that one year than all of U.S. military aid to Turkey from the beginning of the Cold War up to the onset of the counterinsurgency. Almost nobody knew about it here. Very little reporting. The news bureaus had, of course, offices in Ankara. Good journalists. They weren't reporting. The population, we're told repeatedly, is polarized. Um, what the, popu the population here in the United States, we're told repeatedly, is polarized. Yes. Polarized. What do you think about uh, someone who has a media diet, not of the progressive magazine or listening to alternative radio or watching Democracy Now, but is exposed to Fox and Breitbart News and Infowars and Red State and Newsmax and all those other uh, very narrow points of view in, from the media perspective? How do you reach those people? Well, it's a little bit like, first of all, when people talk about the country being polarized or the political system being polarized, it's a little misleading. Uh, the, uh, the Democrats, the roughly uh, liberal population, are pretty much centrist. Uh, the political party, the Democrats, is not very different from what moderate Republicans used to be. If you read the New York Times, you get a fair range of opinion from moderate center left over to far right. It's all there. Uh, but when you turn to Fox News or Breitbart or something, that's different. Then you're in an invented world way off to the right. Uh, so the polarization is it's not mutual. It's... Uh, one directional, uh, but it does lead to a sharply divided population. How do you reach the people? Uh, the way this uh, evangelical uh, professor described it. People are basically, not by, you don't reach them by ridicule, or hatred, or anger, but by recognizing that somewhere down there there's a common humanity, and you gotta go find that, work from there. <laughs>
I'm always uh, looking in, at history for possible lessons and inspiration uh, for what's going on today, Howard Zinn being a, a big influence on me and, and many others. I was in Kansas City um, in very recently and um, learned more about Appeal to Reason. Uh, this was a weekly socialist newspaper that astonishingly in 1910 had a subscription base of 450,000. Uh, I wish today the Progressive Magazine had that many subscribers. Uh, it had a weekly circulation in, in, in the many hundreds of thousands. Its writers were Upton Sinclair, Jack London, Mother Jones, Eugene Debs, and Helen Keller. That's just one example of a past that is largely hidden from view. Uh, we have other examples in Oklahoma, for example. I mean, these are states that you would think are on the extreme right and have been historically. Not the case at all. In 1914, Oklahoma had 175 elected socialist officials in the state. Uh, Eugene Victor Debs in 1900 first ran for president, got under 100,000 votes as Socialist Party candidate. In 1920, 10 years later, while he was in prison in Atlanta, he received almost a million votes. Now, today, you know, socialism is being denounced by the occupant in the Oval Office. It's never going to happen in the United States. But because of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders, the word has been injected into the political uh, discourse once again. What do you think about the possibilities of a socialist outcome? Well, what you say is quite correct. In fact, the most radical uh, democratic movement in American history was uh, the populist movement. I have to say I shudder when I hear the word populism being used today. It has nothing to do with traditional populism. The populist movement was a movement that started with farmers in Texas and moved through the Midwest, uh, Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Wisconsin, up to the north. Major movement, uh, very radical policies uh, they wanted to get rid of the northern bankers uh, who lent them money at, with uh, you know, demanding uh, usurious uh, payments, uh, controlled the marketing system. They wanted to control it themselves, cooperatively owned banks, cooperative organization of marketing, uh, basically developing a socialist society at the base, huge movement. They were just beginning to link up with the Knights of Labor, the major, uh, uh, the first major uh, labor movement, again, a very huge, mostly urban-based movement, which had radical uh, uh, political goals. I mean, one of their slogans was that those who work in the mills should own them. Uh, people should not be, it's hard to remember maybe, but a slogan of the Republican Party uh, back in the mid-19th century Lincoln's Republican Party, was that there's no difference between wage labor and slavery, except that uh, wage labor is temporary until a person can become free again. But no one should be uh, at the command of a master. That's intolerable. Now, that was the view of, that was the view of working people and their press and so on. Now, there's a very rich radical background in the country, uh, far beyond what, what uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, Elizabeth Warren or anybody's talking about. In fact, what's called socialism today is sort of New Deal liberalism. I mean, the maybe extended. Uh, so uh, the programs, the policies that Sanders is advocating it wouldn't really have surprised uh, President Eisenhower very much. You read Eisenhower's statements about labor rights or the New Deal, he, was, he said any political figure who doesn't accept the New Deal and support the rights of working men doesn't, to unionize doesn't belong in our political system. You know, that's not Sanders, that's Eisenhower. Uh, the country has shifted so far to the right that what looks like a 
radical revolutionary position. It used to be normal. And uh, as you mentioned, the among the many forms of American exceptionalism, so-called, is that the word socialism, which usually means moderate social democracy, uh, the word has become a curse word. That's not true anywhere else. If somebody somewhere else says he's a socialist, or for that matter, a communist, it just means you're kind of on the critical edge of the political system. Here, it's uh, it's been turned into a, a four-letter word. You can't utter it. So Sanders seems uh, to be breaking uh, all kind of rules when he uses the word, which is standard everywhere else. Uh, but uh, yes, there's a rich tradition. Actually, uh, Gabriel Kalko, who both of us know, a great historian, died a couple years ago. Uh, he has a very interesting book on American history uh, called uh, Mainstream of American History, actually came out under several different titles, but it's very much worth reading. Uh, one of the things he argues is that after the populist movement in the United States was sort of pretty much crushed by force, uh, many of the radical farmers had just left for Canada and formed the basis of the Canadian uh, social democratic movement, because that's one of the reasons for the relatively more progressive character of Canadian politics. The people just left, uh, people who were represented by Bob LaFollette, the founder of the Progressive and others. Uh, so yes, there is a, and in fact, I don't think this is very far below the surface. If you penetrate surface propaganda, I think people tend to accept these ideas. Uh, you can see it, for example, in uh, polls about uh, almost you know, any issue you look at, say, medical care. I mean, there's been enormous propaganda, corporate propaganda, to try to demonize the idea of some form of national health care. But if you look at polls going far back, when people are asked about it, is health a right that the government should defend? You get very high support. In fact, in, in the Reagan years, uh, when one, of the one of the questions that Gallup, Gallup poll asked was, uh, do you think there ought to be a constitutional amendment that uh, guarantees the right to health care? About 70% of the population agreed. In fact, about 40% of the population thought there already was such a constitutional amendment because it's so obviously the right thing. Uh, take a look at a referenda on this over the years. They start with uh, enormous support for national health care. Then the corporate propaganda starts. You're going to lose your, you won't be able to see your doctor. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, you'll lose your health care. Uh, uh, the government's going to take everything from you. It goes on and on. Uh, you see the numbers supporting it drop. Uh, we're seeing that right now, in fact. Uh, the, the popular support is right below the surface on major issues, gets beaten down by scare tactics. Okay. Uh, so right now, in the New York Times, you know, kind of a moderately liberal journal, uh, when uh, you see an article on Warren's proposal, it's all about how it's unaffordable. Uh, you don't see an article about how the fact that it'll cut American health care spending probably by about half, uh, judging by the uh, model in other advanced countries. Huge savings. Uh, that it, it's possible that taxes will go up, but other savings will go way down. And incidentally, you might want to think about that. Uh, we have a slogan in the United States that uh, the only thing you can't escape is death and taxes. Uh, taxes are considered a horrible burden. You think about it for a minute, and you can see that attitudes towards taxes is a measure, pretty good measure, of the extent to which a country is democratic. If, if you had a perfect democracy, you know, people getting together, making decisions, uh, informed uh, deliberation, deciding here's the plans we want for next year, here's the way we're going to pay for them, 
In a country like that, uh, April 15th would be a day for celebration. We made the decisions. We decided what we wanted. We decided we're going to pay for how we're going to pay for it. Now we're doing it. What's to complain? So, in a real democracy, taxes would be applauded. As uh, you take a look at the at the very other extreme, pure dictatorship, uh, taxes would be hated. Taxes are just something that that alien force, the government, steals from you. Okay, we obviously don't want that. Uh, you might ask yourself where the United States lies in this spectrum and what that implies. None of this is quantum physics. It's right on the surface. Uh, any 10-year-old kid can understand it in no time. But, it's, but you have to penetrate the surface, the surface of doctrine and uh, propaganda and ideology. And I think when you do, you find a lot of common humanity, lots of ways for people to overcome the uh, divisiveness that seems to uh, plague them on the surface. Electoral politics. Can, people are asking, can Trump be beaten in the 2020 election, and who can do it? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't have any crystal ball on that. I think it's touch and go. It uh, depends, on, depends on popular mobilization, uh, uh, dedication, uh, commitment, on breaking through uh, the flood of lies and distortions. Uh, we should mention something that we all know but don't talk about. The crucial issues that really matter for our lives and for our children's lives and future generations are not even being discussed in the election campaign. Okay? Just not discussed. Uh, the worst policy, the worst crime of the Trump administration, there are lots of crimes, but the worst ones far and away beyond any others, are the climate policy and the nuclear weapons policy. Those just swamp everything else in significance. Is anybody talking about them on the campaign trail? I mean, in the impeachment uh, proceedings, are they an issue? Oh. The really critical things are off the agenda. Is If you ask... Uh, whether Trump can be defeated, one of the ways is putting those things right in the center of political concern. Uh, everybody except uh, you know, somebody who's really a pathological maniac uh, wants their grandchildren to have a decent life. Uh, nobody wants their grandchildren uh, to hate them as the worst criminals in history, which is what's going to happen as things are going. Who wants that? How many people, I don't think, just to put a few more dollars in your pocket? Uh, well, I think people can be reached on that. How, how are you doing? Hmm? I've got a few more questions for you, as you can see. Okay. Are you okay? I'm okay so far. All right, let's, let's, because I only have like 356 questions to ask you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to overdo it. Come on. What? But uh, let me ask you about something called PEP. Have you heard of that? P-E-P. -E Progressive except Palestine. Oh. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of an, an interesting aspect of our scene in this country that many who advocate the rule of law, promote human rights, extol the principle of self-determination, and call for freedom and justice everywhere except for Palestine. And that in issue has been so central to your political activism and commitment uh, over the years. And you know, here we are at, almost at the end of 2019, and Palestine is still asunder, still under occupation. Worse than that. Uh, Gaza, which is the most uh, horrendous victim, is probably going to become literally uninhabitable within a few years under constant Israeli attack, uh, boycott, uh, closing of borders, closing of opportunities to destroying the, uh, the health system, the power system, the sanitation, uh, 
preventing uh, uh, fishermen from going out more than a couple of miles, uh, uh, constant military attacks, uh, uh, slaughter or destruction. Uh, the uh, UN monitors are literally predicting that in a couple of years it'll be uninhabitable. Uh, meanwhile, the West Bank, the rest of the area, is, uh, is being uh, sliced up by settlement programs, which are designed, uh, this has been going on since uh, the late, about 1970, one way or another. Both major political groupings are involved in a, a systematic plan to construct a kind of greater Israel, which, will inclu which includes a vast, what, what's called now Jerusalem, which is about five times the size of what it ever was, took in lots of Palestinian villages, which under Trump, uh, changing US policy has now uh, been uh, authorized to be annexed by Israel. It's a sharp change. Uh, to the east, uh, there are corridors built which bisect uh, uh, the, what remains of the Palestinian territory, uh, all Jewish towns, Malda, Dumim, uh, Ariel, others uh, put there. And it's all being integrated into Israel by uh, a very extensive infrastructure developments. If any of you happen to have visited, you know that you can travel around the West Bank on superhighways uh, from, and uh, not even know that there's a Palestinian in existence. Uh, these are all uh, Jewish only or tourist only uh, uh, road structures. Meanwhile, the areas of Palestinian population concentration are being avoided and encircled. Uh, there's like the heavy, heavy population in say Nablus, don't touch that. Uh, the idea is to create a system in which when it all gets integrated and annexed into Israel, it won't affect what they call the demographic problem. Uh, the demographic problem means the too many non-Jews in a Jewish state, okay? So it won't affect that because the Palestinian populations are either being avoided or, or they're being expelled, like in the Jordan Valley, just largely being expelled, uh, which Israel tends to take over. Uh, by now, the Palestinian, I think there are about 160 or so Palestinian enclaves, which are pretty much separated from one another. Uh, farmers are separated from their fields and so on. A very systematic policy. Uh, that's what's been developing before our eyes uh, for pretty much 50 years. Uh, the US has been supporting it, gives it enormous aid. Uh, how about the population here? What do they think about it? I think that's pretty interesting. It used to be an untouchable issue. For years, uh, you've had the same experience. For years, uh, I've tried to give talks on this. I literally had to have police protection in universities. Um, I go to a major university and take one case, UCLA in this case, back in the 80s, I, spent a week giving philosophy lectures, but I was also giving political talks, as I usually do when I go somewhere. And most of them were on Central America at that time. But one professor, uh, a guy who actually happened to be teaching half the year in Tel Aviv, uh, asked me to give a talk on the Middle East. I said, of course, glad to. Uh, the next day I got a phone call from the campus police saying uh, they wanted me to have uh, uniform police uh, with me the entire time I was on campus. I didn't accept that, so they had undercover police following me around the whole time, sitting in on philosophy lectures. Uh, uh, the talk itself was under airport security, you know, one entrance, inspecting handbags and so on. There were meetings physically broken up, even at my own university, MIT. Uh, uh, it was uh, almost impossible to talk about it. Uh, nobody complained at that time about free speech or anything. Uh, this was fine. It changed. About uh, 15, 20 years ago, this started a change. It's now radically different. You go to give a talk on 
Israel-Palestine, you can barely get a hostile question. Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing because there's issues that should be thought about, but there's a radical change. Uh, it shows up even in polls. So for example, uh, the base for uh, support for Israeli policies used to be in liberal America. Uh, the Democrats were the main source for support for Israeli policies, radically changed. And now uh, a majority of uh, people who identify themselves as liberal Democrats are more supportive of Palestinians. This is especially true among young people. Support for Israel in the United States has moved over to the far right. Uh, evangelical Christians, uh, ultra-nationalists, uh, a part of the Republican Party. Uh, now this offers real opportunities for changes in American uh, policy. Unfortunately, it's not being pressed by the by solidarity movements. I think this should be at the top of their the top priority. It's uh, getting U.S. policy to change, and I don't think that's impossible. Uh, just looking at the public attitudes. And looking at the actual policies, uh, you should bear in mind that U.S. Mil military aid, probably all aid to Israel, is illegal under U.S. law. That's a point that could be pressed and made public. Why is it illegal? Well, for one thing, because of the Symington Amendment, 1974, uh, which uh, bans U.S aid, particularly military aid, to any country that uh, constructs nuclear weapons and does not accept the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Well, Israel, of course, does. has a huge nu nu nuclear arsenal. Uh, the way the U.S. gets around it is by pretending, I stress pretending, that it doesn't know that Israel has nuclear weapons. Of course, everybody knows it's a perfectly open secret. But they pretend we don't know. You know, maybe they do, maybe they don't. So we can keep pouring military aid. Uh, uh, Obama had this huge flood of military aid, thirty million dollars over ten years, something like that, by pretending that they don't know that uh, that Israel has nuclear weapons. Uh, there's also the what's called the Leahy Law, Patrick Leahy, which bans military aid to any uh, military unit that is engaged in systematic human rights violations. Uh, the human rights violations are so extreme that we don't even have to talk about them. I think those are issues that could be pressed. Actually, they have a lot of significance beyond Israel. So take uh, what's considered uh, one of the major, and is in fact one of the major problems, dangers in world affairs. Uh, the uh, conflict between the United States and Iran. Uh, the United States is right now imposing, as you know, of course, uh, Trump broke the, uh, the joint agreement under which uh, Iran was uh, banned from developing nuclear weapons, it broke that, and imposed extreme sanctions to try to destroy the economy. And remember, the US is, the US is the only country in the world that can impose sanctions. Just look around. No other country imposes sanctions. They don't have the power to do it. But US power is so enormous that it can sanction anybody it wants and destroy their economy. And furthermore, US sanctions are imposed on third parties. So if, say, uh, Sweden wants to break uh, the US sanctions on uh, Cuba, they'll be cut out of the international financial system, which the US controls. Uh, Europe wants to continue the agreement with Iran, but they can't because the U.S. can cut them out of the international financial system. This is an extraordinary level of power, uh, rarely discussed, uh, but think about it. Uh, there's, there's a very great danger now that conflicts in the Gulf uh, could, even just by accident, uh, break out and lead to war in the region. Well, is there a way to deal with the threat of alleged threat of Iranian nuclear weapons. That is a very simple way to end that threat, which is never discussed. 
how? Uh, introduce a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East with uh, strict verification. And we have very good reason to believe that verification works. Uh, the Even US intelligence agrees that uh, verification of Iran, Iran activities under the joint agreement was perfect. They couldn't find any uh, tight, tight verification, no violations. So introduce a nuclear weapons free zone with verification. That would end any possible concern about Iranian nuclear weapons. Uh, are there barriers to that? I mean, is Iran a barrier? Not at all. Iran's been vociferously calling for it for many years. Uh, what about the Arab states? They're the ones who initiated the proposal uh, 20 years ago, continually bring it up. They want a nuclear weapons free zone. Uh, what about Europe? Well, they support it. Uh, what about the non-aligned countries? Most of the world, they strongly support it. There's one barrier. It's called the United States. Uh, this issue comes up every five years at the non-proliferation treaty review meetings. The last time was 2015 under Obama. Obama vetoed it. Everybody knows exactly why, but you can't talk about it because it would mean that the US would have to acknowledge the existence of Israeli military weapons, nuclear weapons, and furthermore, there would be inspection of Israel's huge nuclear arsenal. That not only can't be done, but it can't even be talked about, right? Try to find a word about it. I mean, I've written about it forever, a couple other people, but just people way at the margins. And this has to do with the one of the major issues in world affairs, uh, the possibility of a war uh, with Iran. But it cannot be discussed. That goes back to your point about uh, PEP. It's much broader. And the threats, oh, there's a tremendous amount at stake. It's not just Israel and Palestine. It's uh, a, a war in the Middle East with Iran would have horrifying consequences. It wouldn't reach the United States. We're too far away. But uh, if, if uh, there's an attack on Iran, almost certain that they would immediately attack uh, the world's major oil resources, which happened to be in northeast Saudi Arabia, uh, in a Shiite area right near Iran. The Shiite population is already very harshly repressed. It's also the main center for Saudi uh, desalination uh, operations, which they depend on. Uh, Iran would certainly attack that right away, and then it would blow up, and who knows where it would go. That would be a horrible affair. Why is that a danger? Because we're not allowed to admit that Israel has nuclear weapons. Just think about that for a minute. Now, what kind of a country are we where this can be happening? Now, just to add something else, the U.S. and Britain have a unique responsibility to move for a nuclear weapons free zone in the region because of something else that's never discussed. Uh, when the US and Britain uh, decided to invade Iraq, uh, they had to concoct some sort of fake legal argument to support it. That's what lawyers are for. Uh, one of the things they did was uh, 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 refer to a UN Security Council resolution uh, I forgot which one, 184, I think, which uh, in 1991, which called on Saddam to terminate his nuclear weapons production, which in fact he had done. We know that story. But if you read that resolution, get down to one of the lower article 14 of the resolution, it commits the signers of the resolution, the United States and Britain, to work to establish a nuclear weapons free zone in the region. We are uniquely uh, res responsible, committed, have, have a responsibility to do this. None of this can be discussed and a tremendous amount is at stake, a possible devastating war, but you can't talk about it. Uh, will you be shot if you can talk about it? No, it's not a dictatorship. We're all free to talk about it. I've been 
talking about it for years. I'm still standing here, sitting here. But uh, so it's a very free country, but we don't use our freedom, okay? Uh, and it's, it's our fault, we can, and a lot is at stake. There's plenty of issues like this around the world. And like I say, they're, they're not quantum physics. They're not hard to figure out. It just takes a little, little thought. Well, what do constitute uh, justice for the Palestinians in your view? What do they want? The Palestinians? Yes. Well, you know, for a long time what they wanted, majority opinion, was in favor of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. Actually, that... Uh, the two-state solution. Two-state solution. Now, that, uh, it's again, not talked about here, but if you go back uh, to the early 70s, that became a major issue on the international agenda. So in 1976, uh, a resolution was introduced in the UN Security Council, which was supported by the major Arab states, uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, Jordan, right on the border of Israel. It was supported by them. It called for a two-state settlement on the internationally recognized border with guarantees for the right of each state to exist, I'm quoting it, to exist in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. Uh, Israel was infuriated. They refused to attend the session. Uh, the United States vetoed it, okay? Continued to veto similar resolutions in later years. Uh, that's, you know, you could argue that the border shouldn't be right on the border. It's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's a military demarcation line, so maybe you straighten it out or something. But uh, that's, that was a possible solution, and that was majority of Palestinian uh, opinion for a long time. By now, mo many Palestinians, probably most, have given up hope on that. They say it's just impossible. The, Settlement has reached such a level that it can't be done. I Personally, I don't agree with that. I think it's still in the ballpark if American policy shifts. Uh, but uh, that leaves them without an option. Uh, many Palestinians, including Palestinian intellectuals, talk about uh, uh, what they call a one-state solution. There should be one state from the Jordan to the Mediterranean with equal rights for everyone. That's simply not an option. Uh, I mean, you can talk because. about it. Because? For a very simple reason. First of all, it has zero international support. It's not going to be supported by African states, for example. S states are very jealous of their sovereignty. And notice that a one-state solution means Israel goes out of existence. As a Jewish state. As, as, as it is now constituted. It's not going to be Israel anymore. It's going to be a majority Palestinian state, whatever you call it. There is no support for that anywhere. Furthermore, if there were any support, uh, Israel would use every weapon at its command, including its huge nu nuclear arsenals, to prevent it. It's kind of academic because there's no, no support for it. But if anything developed, it would never develop. So putting your hope in that is totally meaningless. In fact, the choices today, and for so several years, have been between a two-state settlement and, uh, so, and some sort of greater Israel with Palestinians essentially, uh, you know, like tossed, tossed away. Uh, you can, I mean, you could argue, and it has been argued, that there could be some kind of one state settlement which maintains uh, uh, Jewish sovereignty but allows some kind of rule for Palestinians. A kind of mildly apartheid state. Not pretty, but maybe that could be. What's your position on boycott, divestment, and sanctions? Are you in favor or against? Well, first of all, it's, it's boycott and, di and divestment. There's no sanctions. That's just a slogan. BDS. BDS is a slogan. Mm. But the reality is BD, so let's be honest about it. 
uh, sanctions only come from the United States and they're not coming. Okay. So what about boycott and divestment? I think those are good tactics, but you have to think when you carry out tactics. You have to think about how you, you can't just say, I have a catechism and I'm going to apply it. You have to say, how am I going to apply it? Well, if you take a look at the, uh, actually the boycott and divestment uh, initiatives began in 1997 uh, from uh, Uri of Neri's uh, leading uh, Israeli uh, activist, left activist. Uri of Neri and his uh, group, Gush Shalom, the peace group, uh, uh, organized a boycott divestment campaign uh, aimed at Israel's occupation of the occupied territories. That made very good sense. Uh, that's a clear issue, plenty of support for it, no way of opposing it, and it strikes right at the heart of the major issues. And there have been successes in that. Like, for example, the Presbyterian Church, a big organization, uh, not only uh, in, uh, carry, has a boycott divestment uh, program against the settlements, but also against U.S. multinationals, which are involved in any way in the settlements. Now, that's exactly the right program. That kind of thing has been successful. Now, most of that has been done outside the BDS movement. They have a catechism, three points. Uh, one point is uh, the occupation. Second point is all Palestinian refugees have to return to, have to have the right of return to Israel. Third, we have to boycott Israel until it provides equal rights for Palestinians. Well, you can argue about whether those latter two goals are right or wrong, but one thing is very clear about them. They're not going to be realized, and they are going to engender a reaction which is stronger than the protest. Uh, they're going to engender cries of anti-Semitism, uh, academic freedom, uh, diverting attention away from the Palestinians to some extraneous issue, uh, legislation to ban it because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's anti-Semitic, uh, why Israel, not a dozen other countries, and so on. Uh, it's going to be condemned as utterly hypocritical. Uh, you ban, uh, if you boycott Tel Aviv University, why not boycott Harvard? U.S. has a far worse record than Israel does. And aside from being unprincipled, the goals are unrealizable, and their main effect is to divert attention away from the plight of Palestinians to something else. Uh, freedom of speech, uh, academic freedom, uh, uh, legisla uh, oppressive legislations, everything but the plight of Palestinians. That's a very pointless choice of tactics. The right tactics, I think, are apparent. They ought to be focused on the occupation and on U.S. government policy, kinds of things I mentioned, which can be changed. Uh, even, a, even a threat of cutback of U.S. aid, even a credible threat would have an enormous effect. And I think that uh, those are pretty feasible goals. There are plenty of Americans across the board who, if they knew about it, wouldn't see any reason to uh, provide military aid to a, uh, that happens to be in violation of U.S. law. Okay? A lot of people would be opposed to that. Uh, it's also a way to bring up the major issues. Uh, on the other hand, concentrating on, say, the right of return, first of all, it's never going to happen. Everybody knows it's never going to happen. And it diverts attention away from the real issues. Okay? Uh, same with... Uh, you know, cultural boycotts, maybe you can give an argument for them, but their effect in the real world is to divert attention away from the plight of Palestinians. That's the last thing you want in a solidarity movement. So I think there's a, while the BDS movement has great opportunities, I don't think it's realizing them because of the rigid structure of the doctrine that it accepts. And you just can't deal with the world that way. You can't have, 
rigid doctrines that you try to apply whatever the human consequences. You're never going to get anywhere that way uh, in personal life or anything else. But you do see cracks in what you described as a mon monolithic support for Israel. You do, you do see some cracks. Oh, plenty. Take a look at uh, public opinion among liberal Democrats or among younger people. As you mentioned, yeah. It's uh, very striking. Well, Bernie and Sanders, And we see it in our own experience. Hmm. Uh, you, you don't have the experience you used to when you give a talk on this issue. Right. On Tuesday, August 20th, at 8, at 8 a.m., the FBI came to my door. Agents Carlos Medina and Brian Palmer. They wanted to know about my trip to Iran and whether I knew certain people. And they wanted me to share my experiences in Iran. We're interested in your story, they said, because the Iranian government targets people just like you to manipulate. I said very little and uh, you know, I told them to just leave. Um, and they did leave after about 10 minutes. But it was just enough to scare my wife, Kadriye, who's from Turkey, and has some experience with uh, state authorities knocking on doors or breaking doors down. Uh, and initially, she thought they were Jehovah Witnesses. Because <laughs> they look like that. They look like that stereotype. So as someone who has spent a lifetime uh, in dissent and confronting uh, state power, and its depredations. I know you've had some experiences with what um, John Trudell called the Federal Bureau of Intimidation. Yeah, I've had experiences. But uh, some of them are kind of funny. So for example, uh, take the Pentagon Papers. Uh, I, was, I was a friend of Dan Ellsberg's. I, was, I had advanced copies of the Pentagon Papers and uh, I was one of the people helping to distribute them while he was underground, hadn't identified himself. I was getting phone calls from newspapers in the United States and Europe and elsewhere asking if they could get a piece of the Pentagon Papers. They didn't have any trouble finding me. The FBI never found me, literally. <laughs> they did come to my door, like at, to you, but after Down surfaced and identified himself, and wouldn't talk to them, but uh, the incompetence of the intelligence agencies is pretty astonishing. I mean, I can, if we had time, unfortunately we don't, I've got to leave. But there's amazing stories about this. One of the reasons is they're always looking for people like themselves, you know. They, uh, for example, during the, some of the trials of the resistance, the FBI was never able to find out what was being done because they were always looking for where are the orders coming from? Are they coming from North Korea, you know, Hungary? Or couldn't be that Americans are standing up and saying in town hall, New York, and saying, I hereby conspire to, uh, we hereby conspire to undermine the selective service system. We'll forget about that. That's got to be a that's enough to put them all in jail, but we're not gonna look at that because that's obviously a cover for something. So let's find out what's really going on. That's what was going on, nothing else. <laughs> it's one of the ways to fox intelligence services. <laughs> well, I wanna thank you all for coming this evening, the Progressive Magazine, um, celebrating 110 years of uh, fabulous work and uh, there'll be some books back there and other magazines. Hope you'll support Alternative Radio. Get it on the air here in, in Tucson on KXCI. Give them a call. And finally, I want to ask um, Professor Noam Chomsky uh, this question. Uh, you're turning 91 on December 7th. So they claim. So they claim. <laughs> As you move forward, what, uh, what do you have up your sleeve? <laughs> Not going to tell you. <laughs> At 97, maybe I'll tell you. At 97, we'll be back, hopefully. Thanks very much, Norman. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming.